you're watching The Spark, stories that change our times, produced by MMP-TV. I'm Alex Wiles, your host for today's show. Every day, about 1,000 people are deported from the United States. In 2012, the government spent $18 billion funding agencies like ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. These agencies oversee imprisonment and deportation. In states such as Pennsylvania, undocumented immigrants face struggles like being unable to obtain a driver's license. Forced to live without basic mobility, they risk arrest and deportation if caught driving without papers. Rather than being pushed further into the shadows, immigrant communities and their allies throughout Pennsylvania and around the country are organizing. They are fighting for driver's licenses and they are fighting against ice holes, the practice of detaining individuals suspected of being deportable. Let's start off by hearing from Shayla Quintana about the fight around driver's licenses in Pennsylvania. Shayla is an undocumented student at the University of Pennsylvania and a community organizer with the DREAM Activists, the National Immigrant Youth Alliance, and Fight for Driver's Licenses, Pennsylvania. Shayla's work focuses on expanding the rights of immigrants through education, legislative advocacy, and direct action. So what is the work of the Fight for Driver license, Driver's Licenses, Pennsylvania? So the Fight for Driver's Licenses is an organized network of um, immigrant families across Pennsylvania, and we're fighting to change state law so that people can get a driver's license regardless of immigration status. Um, and this used to be um, allowed between 1992 and 2002 when the law allowed that um, people who did not have a social security number use a tax ID number to get a driver's license. Um, but in response to um, the National Real ID Act in 2005, the state introduced um, requirements for legal presence in its vehicle code. So in 2009, a bunch of people across Pennsylvania got letters of cancellation for their driver's license, which meant that their, um, that their identification was invalidated. Um, and out of that, a bunch of people organized and six people who fought their case in court won their case and were able to keep their driver's license because their due process was violated. Um, but this left thousands and thousands of people in the state of Pennsylvania without being able to get a driver's license, regardless of whether they had before or not. So um, the Fight for Driver's License um, organized to change the law so that it could, so that it, that was possible again. Um, and just last summer, we introduced HB 1648, which is a um, a bill that would essentially um, make the law the way it was before. So if this bill passes, people were people are going to be able to use um, a tax ID number or other kinds of documents to verify their identity, which we think is the point of having a, an ID, right? It's not right. about your immigration status, it's about whether or not you can um, show who you are. Um, and in order to make this possible, um, since this summer we've been connecting with different communities across the state. So right now we have four um, active organizing committees in um, Philadelphia and the Lehigh Valley. Um, in Harrisburg and in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Um, but we've also been connecting with other communities, including Hazleton, Wilkes-Barre, York, Pennsylvania, Chambersburg, Reading. Um, so all these people are organizing to be able to um, make this a law so that they can have a proper identification, so they can access services that require that kind of identification, so they can drive without fear of getting stopped, and so they can be recognized, right? Because at the end of the day, we think it's about equal recognition for all. Okay, it sounds like you guys are very deeply committed to this, this entire struggle, and you guys are very organized, which mm -hmm. I think is great. So what we're gonna see next is a clip uh, from a video that Fight for Drivers Licenses has created to describe its work to new members. de hoy, sino que tenemos que estar continuamente, continuamente, y pues bienvenidos todos los que llegaron hoy y seguir este, motivando a los demás, y si no se puede, pues nosotros somos quienes debemos de seguir luchando. Eh, yo me integré a esto de lucha por licencias, eh, llevo un año en esto, en el comité, y pues 
pero yo sé que no va a ser fácil luchar con, con esto de las licencias, pero estamos apoyando lo más que se pueda y espero que escuchen este video y que vean que la comunidad está en, siempre en sombra, si no queremos, queremos estar en sombra, sino al contrario, salir también y, y que vean también el trabajo que nosotros hacemos. Pues aparte, aparte también la licencia es muy básica para nosotros y esperamos que nos puedan apoyar y ayudar. Uh, mi nombre es José Luna, soy mexicano, originario de Puebla. Mi, uh, tengo 24 años y soy indocumentado. Yo llegué a los Estados Unidos cuando tenía 15 años de edad. Uh, mi experiencia fue muy dura, muy, uh, muy triste a la vez, al dejar a mi familia atrás, a mis padres, mis hermanos. El no tener una licencia o una identificación es como decir que tú no existes, no, no eres nadie y afecta demasiado porque la economía que se vive en Orriston está producida principalmente por gente indocumentada. Yo sé que no es fácil en nuestra situación, pero eso nos ayudaría demasiado a, a promover a, trabajos, crear más empleo para otra gente, este, sería más, más seguro manejar en las carreteras. Lucha por licencias es un, es un paso muy, muy enorme y yo pienso que es muy, muy, muy efectivo, sería muy efectivo el luchar por las licencias porque demasiados estados están haciendo lo mismo y entonces deberíamos todos hacerlo, hacerlo, hacerlo igual. Y yo pienso que, que si todos hacemos algún formulario, hacemos algún, algunas ideas y yo creo que, que si todo eso está planteado y platicamos con un, con un, un legislador o legisladores o con un, con un juez que nos ayude para convencerlo a tener una licencia sería, muy, sería a la vez muy educativo para nosotros al saber que, que, que podemos hacer algo. participado en eventos de Harrisburg, eh, hemos a, ido a tocar puertas con los senadores, eh, ha habido respuesta de algunos que gracias, se los agradecemos mucho por estar, um, no sé si para ellos es importante o nos toman como diciendo el sí, pero espero que esa respuesta que nos dieron de verdad sirva para nosotros, que no nomás estén jugando con, con esta lucha que estamos haciendo, la comunidad. Se unan a nosotros y que sigamos con, con esta lucha porque realmente no solamente soy yo la que va a ganar, sino vamos a ganar todos si nos apoyamos unos a otros y que somos seres humanos y que espero que esto les toque el corazón a todos, que, que tenemos hijos y que ellos tienen hijos. Y el sueño sería que podríamos ejercer esta vida normal, esta vida, esta vida que ya no, ya no haya más tristeza, que ya no haya más preocupaciones, que ya no haya más... Facilitaría mi vida al tener una licencia, al tener un documento que, que indique mi nombre. Muchos de nosotros queremos un, por lo menos una identificación, una licencia en este estado. No debería de existir miedo, no debería de existir desigualdad, todos somos iguales y deberíamos de luchar por ese, por ese, por ese pequeño o ese pedacito de ayuda que nosotros deberíamos de tener desde un principio. Welcome back to The Spark, stories that change our times, produced by MMP-TV. I'm Alex Wiles, and we are talking with Shayla Quintana of Fight for Drivers Licenses Pennsylvania. Shayla, how do your opponents justify denying the rights to your driver's license, and what is your response? So a lot of, a lot of what we keep hearing is that allowing undocumented immigrants to get a driver's license will lead to more fraud and also that it's a national security issue. Um, and also one of the things that we usually hear is that undocumented people don't have rights. 
Um, so what we say to that is that, first of all, those two are unfounded. Like, um, there have been, just last, last year alone, seven states that implemented similar um, laws that allowed certain that allowed undocumented immigrants to get certain kinds of licenses, and they have seen um, in the implementation process or afterwards no like right. no increase in fraud. So they already have a good example of what would happen if these mm -hmm. laws were to go through, and obviously these allegations of fraud are untrue, right? Right. Okay. There's no basis for that, right, or for basis. the national security threat, right? Like undocumented immigrants are not a not secure are not a threat to national security, and there's no basis for the argument. And the other one about um, not having rights while we're organizing to to claim our rights, right? Because we do have them, just like every other human being, um, and we want the law to recognize them. Right. So you told us about your work to introduce this bill. If it is introduced and it does pass, what happens to your work then? Will passing the bill be enough, is what I want to know. Um, the short answer is no, because um, after that comes making sure that it's implemented um, and being part of that process to make sure that it's something that it's a process that meets the needs of the community um, and that doesn't um, undo some of the work that we've been doing with them. And it's also going to be a, um, a matter of informing people of how to get a driver's license, what the process is like. So info sessions and being part of the implementation process is going to be very crucial. Right, so this is like a, actually a much larger movement yeah. than just the fight for driver's licenses, even though that is a central issue, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's the pillar of your struggle right now. Yeah. All right, so Shayla, tell me, why are you personally involved in this fight? What drives you to be a, a participant in all of this? So I'm undocumented myself, and so is most of my family. Um, I came to the United States when I was 10 years old, and I've been undocumented since then. Um, I'm now 21, and uh, um, a bunch of my family members need a driver's license, so I take this as a very personal issue um, that I'm not only fighting for, well, I'm fighting for all these families, but it's also, you know, my family, you know, right. making sure that my mom, if she gets stopped by the police, has something, some documentation to show her um, identity so that a traffic stop doesn't lead to a potential deportation, which we have seen is, um, um, true of a lot of the um, deportations that happen, a lot of deportations begin with a traffic stop um, and people not being able to supply um, identification. So it's very personal. I understand. All right. So thank you so much, Shayla, for giving us your time. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. My next guest is Mia Leah Kiernan, co-founder and national organizer of One Love Movement. One Love Movement was born out of a detention and deportation crisis in Philadelphia's Cambodian-American community. From there, it grew into a movement to address the root causes of forced migration, such as U.S. militarism and destructive U.S. foreign policy, conditions of poverty, the experience of trauma in our communities, divestment in education, the prison industrial complex, and unjust deportation policy. One Love Movement now exists as a national network. Tell us about how you got involved in this work and how One Love Movement got started here in Philadelphia. Sure. Um, so One Love Movement began it during the fall of 2010 in Philadelphia. Um, at that time, there was a push by the Obama administration to focus deportation on quote unquote criminal aliens. Um, and so that includes, uh, based on 1996 laws that were passed um, on immigration, uh, it includes a wide array of people who fall into that category of criminal alien. Um, people, that d in 1996, it expanded the definition of aggravated felony under immigration law to include um, shoplifting, public display of indecency, things like this um, are all deportable mandatorily now. Um, it also took away people's um, ability to go before a judge, an immigration judge, and have, have their case heard. So it takes away the right to due process right, as well? Right, exactly. Okay. Um, and then it also made deportation permanent for aggravated felonies. So people you would um, pr prior um, have a 10-year bar or something like that, right. and at this point um, now will be removed permanently from their homes and their families. So there were a lot of different things um, that triggered this um, in 1996, but now uh, three or four years ago there was a real push by the Obama administration to focus on those people for deportation. So we saw that hit. Um, the Cambodian-American community here in Philadelphia as well as other 
um, other Cambodian American communities around the country. So people came together in that crisis and um, informed One Love Movement in response to that. Um, and for the first year of our existence, we were really fighting to get people out of detention who had been detained um, to try to stop their deportation from happening. Over the course of that year, um, it became clear that that wasn't going to happen. And by the end of it, we were just fighting essentially for people to have the right to take luggage back with them to Cambodia. So we really, so really saw pushed into a corner in that. Um, yeah. how deep it was that, that we were um, being politically scapegoated in a really real way. There's a new coalition that has been doing some powerful work around ending the collaboration between the Philadelphia police and ICE, ICE being the organization that oversees the, these detentions and these deportations. Would you tell us about the Philadelphia Family Unity Network Coalition and One Love's work to end ICE holds? Mm -hmm. So the Philadelphia Family Unity Network came together um, about a year ago, and that's um, One Love Movement, Victim Witness Services of South Philadelphia, a New Sanctuary Movement, Juntos, and the Pennsylvania Immigration and Citizenship Coalition. Um, and we came together to fight ICE holds, and ICE holds are essentially the way that our local criminal justice system, law enforcement, and our jails in the Philadelphia County um, hold people on detainer, what's called a detainer, um, to be transferred over to ICE. So for us, how we vision that is that it's basically a back channel of how our city of Philadelphia is handing off people into a whole deportation machine. Um, so our big cause around it was that we um, wanted that to happen if it was going to happen in the open. Like, don't let it happen behind closed doors where people can't be seen and there's no accountability for it. So um, at first you were asking for just a little transparency. You weren't just asking for all out stoppage of it. You just wanted it to be in the open. Well, so what, what ice holds are is just that, is the non-transparency part of it within our city of Philadelphia, right? Which is that they hold people in Philadelphia jails and then are transferred to ICE um, in this back channel way. And so by stopping ICE holds, which is what the, the what PFUN essentially has, has organized to try to do um, and has done, um, we stop that back channel and just basically say to ICE, because they will find other ways to meet their quota. We know that that's, this is not going to end deportation in Philadelphia, but at the, at the least of it, it'll happen um, with transparency and accountability and where right. the community can rise up against it. Because if they want to come get people, they need to come to our community and get people. They can't do it behind closed doors the way they have been doing. All right, let's take a look at the city council hearings that One Love and the coalition organized. It is hereby ordered. Every Philadelphian or person in Philadelphia has the right to feel safe, secure, and protected. And I believe that our new policy established by the executive order I will sign shortly will promote safety because residents and others who are here will not need to fear that interacting with their government will result in a detainer for themselves or their loved ones. It was a joint effort and, um, you know, without the community support, without, uh, you know, our community partner, um, that wouldn't happen at all. But um, it was a movement lead by the people for the people. Immigration is a human right and as such should be dealt with more humanely. And to ask the city of Philadelphia to its council to end the existing collaboration between its police department and the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. We ask that our city's deeply rooted values of redemption, rehabilitation, second chances, and reintegration be applied and fought for for all residents of Philadelphia 
instead of allowing a mandatory indiscriminate federal deportation system to apply double punishment that directly disintegrates certain populations in our city. Porque existe una historia de desconfianza en las comunidades inmigrantes, necesitamos un mandato claro que separe la policía local de las autoridades de deportación. What is new about the campaign this time is that diverse community groups, service providers, and advocacy organizations came together and decided to reject the framework imposed upon us by federal immigration system of the good immigrant versus the bad immigrant. Ninguna persona merece ser deportado sin importar su estatus migratorio ni récord criminal. Y no podemos definir a las personas eh, si la persona es criminal o no es criminal. When strangers sojourn with you in your land, you shall do them no wrong. The strangers who sojourn with you shall be as natives among you, and you should love them as yourselves because you too were strangers in Egypt. We need to stop attacking our community, our kids, our school, our people, our future. They are our future. Because when our communities are under attack, what do we do? We stand up and fight back. We stand up and fight back against any ice on the city of Philadelphia. We're the next best city in progressive movement here, um, but again, it's a starting point, not the ending point. Welcome back to The Spark, stories that change our times, produced by MMP-TV. I'm Alex Wiles, and we are talking with Mia Leah Kiernan, national coordinator of One Love Movement. So, One Love Movement's work really widens the definition of immigrant rights. Would you tell us about One Love's connection to other struggles and its work with other communities and organizations? Sure. Um, I think that when One Love first began, like I was saying, it, there was really a way that we got funneled into a really tight box. And it was immigrant rights, it was refugee rights, um, it was Asian community. And I think that after we had gone through such a huge loss in our first year of losing a lot of people to deportation um, and families being broken apart in our communities, we really had to take some time to develop bigger analysis about it. Um, so that we could really stay in this fight for the long run and not be beat down every time we, we lose. And so I think the way that we've really analyzed this is that this is not just about deportation, that this is actually about keeping our families together for another generation, right? That as people who come from a refugee community, we, um, our parents, our, our grandparents have been through um, U.S. imperialism, U.S. militarism, um, 300 tons of U.S. bombs being dropped on Cambodia and creating a genocide that killed a quarter of the population. Um, our families surviving through those things and having to be resettled in a country that isn't their own and displaced, um, all because of um, foreign policy that is destructive um, and murderous. And so coming here to this country, being resettled in neighborhoods in poverty, along with many people in the United States that suffer in these conditions without access to equal education, um, health care, all of these things that are so important in particular, um, knowing as refugee families that people suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder and that trauma is a really important um, piece that we need to address in our healing. So this is also about healing, not exactly. just, okay. Yeah, but knowing that moving forward that deportation just is one of the mechanisms that happens to be affecting our generation right now, but that our communities need to be built and ready for whatever is going to happen next to keep our families together against all these systems that fight to keep our communities broken. So what's the one thing that I'm getting is very unique about your struggle is that the people who are participating in it, the people who are steeped and embedded in it, face the risk of literally being taken out of the country. Mm -hmm. And that is just one of the many ways that your opponents would, you know, destroy your movement. So when you talk about healing, what do you mean? And why is healing important to your work? Um, we really think about how our work needs to happen at the intersection of organizing and healing, um, that we can't just be fighting against things all the time and, and fighting against unjust policies that we need to be fighting for um, our right to heal um, in our communities, communities that have been oppressed for many generations, um, and that that is our source of empowerment and that we have to be building those spaces for us to do that together. Um, or if, if we don't, then we'll just be fighting back against things. Right, so can you tell me about some like recent examples of that, like what kind of spaces or what kind of processes you guys would use to go about doing that? I think that it's also it's it happens in um, in 
in One Love's experience, the people who are being deported are people with prior criminal convictions, right? And so many of those people, like we said before, are labeled as criminal aliens. And um, the way that we get thrown under the bus is that people are seen as like violent, you know, uh, murderers, rapists, all of these things that people who are threats to society and dangerous to our communities. Um, and there is a way where often the people who are being deported have committed violent offenses. They have hurt other people. They have caused harm in their communities. Right. And that we have to envision an alternative system um, that doesn't deport, remove, incarcerate people from our communities. That there's other ways for us as communities to be accountable to the mistakes and the harm we cause um, that isn't about removing people Are you talking from the more about rehabilitation and healing as opposed to incarceration and deportation? Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. And so I think we, we like steep very heavily in that. And a lot of people on our network have served a lot of time in prison, um, have come to their own way of like, of envisioning a, a way to be accountable to the harm they've caused and to, um, to creating victim-centered and community-centered processes for healing in this, this larger picture of US militarism, violence, um, harm that is created by a system that we live in. And so we as people need to be creating the alternative to, to, that, to that harm. Okay. So when you talk about U.S. militarism and U.S. militarism, especially with movements like NAFTA, this, there's, this na there's this narrative that's going around that I hear really often that describes immigrants as people who are here to steal resources and reap the benefits of, well, mostly the welfare state is what I'm always getting. So what what do you have to say to your opponents when they when they say things like that? Well, in I guess in the in terms of uh, the larger transnational picture, mm -hmm. um, we're here for a reason, right? We're here because of the transnational trade that has displaced a lot of families from Mexico, from Vietnam, from Cambodia. In addition for, to militarism, um, and uh, that's I think that's the beginning, and then to come and when people are displaced and come looking for the resources that they can no longer find in their countries, um, and to tell them that they're stealing from the U.S. is kind of hypocritical, I think. But um, but also the statistics show that that's not true. You know that that's another thing that's unfounded. That the vast majority of welfare recipients are white Americans, um, so it's not even people of color, and it's definitely not immigrants. And I think for us, we talked about too about um, our experience as Cambodian Americans is, is living through genocide. Um, but we talk about it as, as in terms of the broader international community coming to the United States as living through genocide that is economic and human, right? That, um, that, that can come in, in a lot of forms. All right, this has been a great interview. Thank you, Mia Leah from One Love Movement and Shayla from Fight for Drivers Licenses Pennsylvania for talking with us today about these important issues. Thank you for having us. Thank you for watching The Spark, stories that change our times, produced by MMP-TV. For more stories about everyday people who are leading the way to winning our human rights, visit us online at thespark.tv. Thank you. I'm Alex Wiles.